Ukrainians, like, they're real people. They have real jobs. They, they're not harmful. The problem with welcoming people from Syria or Somalia or Nigeria or in these different odd countries mm. is that they, they could be terrorists. <laughs> that was what a man said on Twitter. The Russia and Ukraine war is not an African problem. What do you mm. talk so much? You know, if it was, if the roles were reversed, like they, we would not be welcomed, or at least mm -hmm. the journey would be much harder for us. It wouldn't be as easy to be accepted into certain countries. Hello, Globies. Welcome to the World Health Investigation Podcast. My name is Jocelyn. I'm Edna. We are young global health professionals and your hosts for the World Health Investigation Podcast. Also known as the WHI, we will be discussing all things global health, unpacking the most controversial health and social issues, as well as promoting new and global health development and equity. So, uh, Dina, what is the tea in global health today? Today, today, mm -hmm. I actually do have some tea in the news. Do you have some tea? Do you drink tea today? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. drink tea? Because I was waiting for this tea. <laughs> you waiting for this tea? Because this is the real tea. Is the real tea? <laughs> okay, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, what, yeah. what you got? So, I actually wanted to focus on something a bit more positive mm -hmm. in the world right now. Yeah. So, my people mm -hmm. from Zimbabwe. Oh. Shout out to Zimbabwe. Zim, zim. So, Zimbabwe became the first African country to approve use of the injectable HIV prevention drug. Um, it's called CAB-LA, which is short for Long-Acting Injectable Carbotegravir. Come, come at us with the facts. With the facts, mm -hmm. yeah. And this happened, um, I think, around like mid October is when mm -hmm. it was approved and then announced. So, for the people that don't know, prep. We use something called prep in HIV prevention, yes. and prep is short for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So that's basically about using antiretroviral medication to prevent HIV infection, and we use it in people who don't have HIV. So this is to help them prevent getting HIV. Okay. Um, and yeah, so for a long time, there was a daily pill that you could take mm -hmm. as PrEP. Mm -hmm. But obviously that had challenges when you think about it. It's like sometimes people would forget to take their pill and it's like, ah, I'm going to take this pill every day yeah. and I'm going to have oh, HIV. It's, yeah. it's long. Uh, but now with this um, Cab LA, it's an injectable. So initially, the first time you get it, you get two injections mm -hmm. in the first month. Mm -hmm. though, like you get two injections and they're one month apart. Mm -hmm. And then after that, every two months, you get the injection. Okay, okay. So well, it's long acting. It's long acting. That, that's a brilliant new invention. Right? <laughs> it's a new... We need it. I think, yeah, I've, I've heard of people living with HIV that have complained about how stressful it is to have to take the medication every day as an yeah. hour of the day. Yeah. Sometimes you forget yeah. or you just think you'll encourage them to, you know, be more timely on the track with your medication. Yeah, for sure. And I think for me, what's really encouraging is, I think if I look back, it was first approved by the FDA, the mm -hmm. Federal Drug Administration in America, in December last year. Mm -hmm. And now we're October 2022 and we have the first African country actually approving come, it, you know like historically hiv we remember how long it took to get hiv treatment, treatment. to countries low uh, to low and middle income countries so yeah. it's really i think encouraging to it's, see this and to actually see like an african country prioritizing like different you know methods of prevention for mm. people who, who don't have hiv yet. don't have hiv yeah yet. that's brilliant yeah lovely news shout out to zim shout out to zim. Oh, I'm waiting for the I rest mean, of you now she is zim now so we will not rest <laughs> she, <laughs> she, is zim now. she is are you zim or are you so i am both you're both why can't i be both mm. see edna yeah she's always conflicted Conflicted. conflicted. I'm never conflicted. <laughs> no one's conflicted though. Who's oh, conflicted? People who are born. Ah! <laughs> How did you manage to switch it? <laughs> the, way, the way you try to make connections between conflicts, yes. conflicts yes. in oneself to yes. walk. You see, Edna here, she somehow managed to link personal conflicts to war. Yes. So, <laughs> How 
how is there a connection? I am doing my duty as a good co-host of this podcast to make all these transitions. Transition. And links. And links. Okay. Is that Jocelyn? Mm-hmm. I know you were in the streets of the world. Oh. Uh, you just uh, walking uh, around. The streets. Thinking about... What are the statistics? The statistics yeah. in the streets of the planet Earth. Yeah. The streets yes. of worldwide global health. Yes. <laughs> I know I'm literally health. stretching this joke. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so while a full picture is yet to be established, the UNHCR, mm-hmm. which for those who don't know what it stands for, do you know? Yes, <laughs> I know this one. United <laughs> Nations High Commissioner for refugees. Okay, okay. I actually put her on the yes. spot there and she she, yes. she got it right. Yes. High so. Commissioner for Refugees. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they estimate that global force displacement has reached 103 million as of mid-2022. Wow. 103 million. 103 million are currently being displaced across the globe. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fact. A lot of people. It's a lot, of, a people. lot of people. Sometimes we tend to think when you think of uh, of refugees and moving across the world, you may think it's a certain group of people, um, but it's actually 103 million. It's yeah, quite a lot. Yeah. That leads me on to my next point about how many refugees come from which countries. So, more than seven in ten of all refugees under the UNHCR's mandate and other people in need of international protection. Come from five countries. Can you guess? Just five. Um, off the top of my head, Syria. Mm. I just know back in 2015, uh, yeah. there were a lot of people coming from Syria. Yeah. Um, and then this year, I wonder if Ukraine is on the list. Mm. Because yeah. of the war this year. Yeah, actually, you are correct. Those two are on the list. Uh, we have the Syrian Arab Republic with about 6.8 million. Mm-hmm. We have Venezuela, Ukraine with 5.4 million, Afghanistan and South Sudan. Ah, okay. So these are the top five countries mm-hmm. that occupy, that uh, tend to uh, have the most refugees. I, I mean, in terms of this statistic, it's about 74%. You know what I found interesting? Actually, I just thought of it now. It's like, it's actually like from different continents. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm not gonna lie, some people they tend to think war is just in the Middle East for some reason, mm. and it's just people of a certain skin tone and they look a certain way of a certain, certain religion so, that are coming in as immigrants. I think she went there, you went there, it's a I went there. too soon. I went there. You need it, was time. I didn't waste time. But I'm sorry, carry on, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. So, what is I found interesting is also that Turkey. Host the largest number of refugees with 3.7 million people. And Colombia is second with more than 2.5 million, including other people in need of international protection. Wow. Now, low and middle income countries host about 74% of the world's refugees. 74%? Yes. Are in low and middle income countries? Yes. I know this makes quite sound quite shocking yeah. because when you think of refugees, you may think, okay, the usual assumption and stereotype is that refugees are all trying to flee to Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. the statistics are mm-hmm. quite showing something different because at the moment it's actually low and middle income countries that are tend to be the most welcoming to accept refugees, mm-hmm. and um, the least developed countries provide asylum to twenty two percent in total. Of this total, wow! I mean, it actually surprised me when I first heard that. But when I thought about it, I was like, it could, it low key, it could make sense mm. because when you think about it, not you know, it's already hard to have to leave your home. No one yeah. wants to do that, and it's yeah. a long journey. Mm. Especially if you don't know where where to go next, you're not yeah. gonna jump like, oh, let me go to a different continent. Mm. So I'm guessing many people, you know, they just tend to go to neighboring countries. Yeah. That's, yeah, it could be just as simple as that. They just yeah. find a country that's neighboring, and if they're understanding, they're, they are understanding. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's the statistic. Yeah. So did you have something that you wanted to add in terms of personal examples and <laughs> stories? Because when you hear of these statistics, it's like, okay, that sounds quite nice. Yeah. But 
what does that mean on the more personal, personal level? level? Yes, that's a great transition question. Because <laughs> uh, I do have a story. Our case study today, I came across um, the story and we'll link to it uh, because I'll just, you know, brief, brief, briefly go into it and summarize. So I'm going to tell the story of someone called Assad. I came across the story and okay. we'll link back to it. Um, so he is telling the story of his journey from Somalia to Europe. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so Assad, when he was telling the story, he was 20, so I imagine he was like slightly younger when he um, fled Somalia. 20 is actually such a very young. It's a very young age. Mm -hmm. So what happened was back when he was in Somalia, Assad was a motorcycle taxi like driver. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day, some men threatened him and they forced they forced him to take them on their motorcycle on his motorcycle taxi. Mm -hmm. And then he started to realize that these people were terrorists. Uh, but he had no choice and he had to give them all a ride. So while they were on the roads, they came to a police checkpoint and he was scared. And he didn't want the police to see him with the terrorists. So he stopped the motorcycle and he just ran. Man just ran and said, I'm not dealing with this. Mm. Uh, it was smart, I think. That's a small approach. <laughs> yeah. So the terrorists start shooting at him. Uh, the police now start shooting back at the terrorists and there's a whole exchange, but he sort of stays away from there. Um, but afterwards, anyway, the police arrested Assad, mm -hmm. uh, the motorcycle driver taxi, taxi driver, rather. <laughs> and um, he driver of taxi. Driver of taxi. That's <laughs> what I meant. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and he told them what happened. He yeah. told them, like, oh, this is the situation. They're like, oh, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. However, what happened was, now the terrorists had beef with Assad. They say, how could you have just left us? Why are they trying to... So they said, you could not... You have to stay loyal. You, you can't be a snitch. You can't be loyal. You, can't, you have to die with us. You have to die with us too. <laughs> um, and yeah, but actually, tragically, they um, found his family mm -hmm. and actually shot his mother. Oh my. So, he clearly, he was in danger. His family was in danger. So that's what made him decide to leave Somalia. No, he had a whole interesting journey where he was going like from different parts of the world just to make his way eventually to mm -hmm. France. To France. To France. Oh, la France. La France. Now, while he was in France, there was just one night where he was in an asylum seeker center mm -hmm. and he fell out of his bunk bed uh, while he was sleeping and he fractured his spine. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says the pain was terrible. I couldn't sit down, so I had to stay standing up. But despite the accident, the police sent him to a police station um, mm -hmm. in France where he was locked up for 41 days. And in those 41 days, he only saw a doctor once. Oh, my goodness. So he has a broken back. Oh, broken. He could have died. Yeah. In that moment. He could have been paralyzed. But, yeah. Mm. Anyway... At some point, the police tell him that he was going to be deported. He was going to get sent back to his country. Um, he went to the airport. They actually took him to the airport. But then when the pilot saw him and that he couldn't sit down and he was in a lot of pain, the pilot refused to take him on board. Mm. And so then he continues, returned around and went back to the police station. The police officers left me at the front door and said, you're free. I was lost and in so much pain. I walked and walked, but I had nowhere to go. Yeah, so he was free, technically, yeah. with a broken back, with a broken nowhere back. to go, no papers. Yeah, I forgot to mention at one point he was um, in Libya and some people stole his like belongings and his identity and all his passports mm. and stuff. Yeah. So he's walking around and it seems he ended up like somewhere close to the border between France and Spain. Mm -hmm. So there's a family that came across him and they just saw that he was in pain and they could tell that he just needed help. But they realized that to get help for someone who's... A migrant in France versus in Spain, it was going to be easier in Spain. Mm -hmm. So they crossed over the border to Spain to try and get him help. Mm -hmm. They called an ambulance, but as soon as the guy who found Assad mentioned that, oh, I think this person is a migrant, mm -hmm. the ambulance refused to come. What? The ambulance just refused to come. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. Then they were like, okay, let's go to the Red Cross. They have a migrant center that was nearby, but apparently no one was there. And in the end, um, they met someone who was willing to call the hospital again, and eventually the hospital showed up. Yeah. <sighs> this sounds. This this is very sad. This yeah. story hits home. Yes. Yeah. 
I can't imagine being in that position where you're literally facing a very, very traumatic experience mm-hmm. and you're trying to access healthcare mm-hmm. and you cannot because of your immigration status. Okay, mm-hmm. so I think that leads us to first looking into the perspective of, you know, refugees, people who are displaced as a result of war or conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to make sure we're all on the same page, yeah, let's just, you know, differentiate a little bit between migrant and refugee. So typically, refugee, we're talking about people who typically have to leave their home country because of war, conflict, right. fear of persecution, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then migrants are typically people who leave their home country, typically by choice, yeah. so that they can seek better job opportunities, education, mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. Okay, that's yeah. a very good distinction yeah. between the two. Exactly. My question is, like, where does that lead to expats? The expats. Yeah. I think expats are under the broad category of migrant, mm-hmm. but how we think about expats. So when you think of an immigrant, what do you think of? This is what you think of an expat. I like I know it's wrong, but I think of like a refugee. I think of mm. someone who's fleeing from persecution. Like someone like me right now. Yeah. Like I'm not from the UK. Yeah. But I moved to the UK. You are a migrant. I'm a migrant. Am I an immigrant? a great question because i moved into the uk you, yeah you did move into the uk you are an immigrant i think i'm okay. an immigrant so i think the the, the the definition sometimes is different when you have like someone coming from the u.s into uh tanzania mm. they're an expert right they get called an expert an expert so i just think it's it's, it's just interesting to have these these different definitions <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely something to be said, and we were seeing it as well, I think, last year, at some mm-hmm. point when the U.S. was pulling out of Afghanistan, yeah. and a lot of people were trying to move to the U.S. or U.K. or whatever it yeah. may be, but clearly there were certain, there are certain, I think, migrants that are favored mm-hmm. versus other migrants mm-hmm. or refugees. Yes. Yeah. Because there is, like, a negative connotation with the word immigrant yeah so when you hear of immigrant you think oh people are trying to come to the country and invade the space yeah that they, they're not supposed to invade mm-hmm. yeah. yeah 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 anyways yeah our perceptions of of those words 100 percent. so i think one thing that was interesting for me was to look at how different countries in europe have so far like reacted to immigrants or mm. refugees specifically yeah. when it came to healthcare. Yeah. So some of you may have heard of the UK's hostile environment policies. Yes. Of course. It's in the na- hostile environment. Yes. They said we don't want these refugees. We don't want them. And I thought it was mad. Like at first I thought it was just these policies and no one was like quiet about the fact that they really meant to like deter refugees but they were very mm-hmm. outright mm-hmm. they were very outright um in fact one of the, the the immigration minister mark harper at the time the bill was first proposed for this hostile environment measures he said the bill would stop migrants using public services to which they are not entitled reduce the pull factors which encourage people to come to the uk and make it easier to remove people who should not be here wow that was just like a public statement who should be here and who should not be here? That's a great question. That is a great question. So, just in general, this was just a series of laws in the UK that were introduced around 2014. Mm-hmm. And they include measures to limit access to work, housing, healthcare, bank mm-hmm. accounts, mm-hmm. and even more. So, normally, it's it's a system of like citizen-to-citizen immigration checks. Yeah. It's just like y'all are just reporting each other. Okay. Um, and the majority of these proposals actually became law through the Immigration Acts 2014. Mm-hmm. And they've actually been like tightened since then as well. Right. Um, and so when it comes to healthcare, under these hostile environment like measures, employers, landlords, NHS staff, mm-hmm. and other public servants have to check a person's immigration status before offering them a job housing, healthcare, or other support. Mm -hmm. So the government guidance actually uh, makes it a duty Mm -hmm. for the NHS to charge patients not deemed to be ordinarily resident in the UK. Mm -hmm. This means that patients who have, you know, a precarious immigration status, they're just a little bit in the grey zone, 
maybe they're they've applied for asylum but it's still in process mm-hmm. um you know people in such situations they are left with like really bills that can go up to like thousands of pounds mm-hmm. just for seeking health care mm-hmm. um and yeah some sometimes we even have um cases where people are just denied care up front yes that's 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 i think that's a bit crazy yeah to be denied care like that because of your immigration status mm-hmm. I think when you mentioned the whole um, issue around hostile policies towards immigration and refugees in the UK, mm-hmm. it automatically made me think of the statistics back in 2015 oh. and, and how um, some European countries were reacting towards like refugees coming from Syria. Yeah. Uh, yes, I went there. Yeah. <laughs> so the UN Refugee Agency estimates that 1.7 million Ukrainians mm-hmm. have fled in less than two weeks when the war has actually started around that time. Mm-hmm. And these numbers reflect the fact that, thankfully, the borders are open and therefore Ukrainians are able to flee. Mm-hmm. But then the question now is, why are we seeing such a stark contrast with European responses in 2015? Mm-hmm. Is it that now we've become much more welcoming towards the field of in general? Mm-hmm. Is it that now the world is now more understanding that, okay, we need to accept more refugees? Mm-hmm. Why are these statistics a lot better in 2022? Because of like acceptance of acceptance refugees. Acceptance of refugees. Oh, I really do wonder. <laughs> I really do wonder because people have been seeking asylum for many, many years. Yeah. People from different countries and uh, for the first time we have people of a certain skin tone. Yes. Um, that have been affected by mm-hmm. a conflict mm-hmm. in a very serious way. That people that they require refugee yeah. refuge rather. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that I'm not gonna lie. That's my personal point of view. I do think that race plays into it. Yeah. Race, religion, proximity to like the cultures where I do think a lot of like European countries, Ukraine is part of Europe. They're able to like identify and empathize with Ukrainian people compared mm-hmm. to people they perceive as being from further away, people from Syria, South Sudan. South Sudan. You know what I mean? Yeah, I... That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's very valid. I even came across a tweet that that was saying in response to this that, um, you know, Ukrainians, they're real people. They have real jobs. They're not harmful. The problem with welcoming people from Syria or Somalia or Nigeria or in these different odd countries, mm. it's that they, they could be terrorists. <laughs> that was what a man said on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, well, what are your thoughts on that? And, and <laughs> I try, you know, war is bad. Mm-hmm. Everyone who's experiencing war, it's, it's, a hor- it's a horrible situation, and I don't want anyone to go through it. And I will say I saw similar things and they kind of, they, they, they made me mad mm-hmm. um, because I was, it really highlighted to me the fact that even in the middle of crisis, like racism can be like so pronounced like this mm-hmm. in the middle of a war. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say like, you know, what the Ukrainians are going through is terrible mm-hmm. and we should definitely, you know, offer refuge and all these things. It's a good thing mm-hmm. that it was so easy for them to find a uh, refuge. Mm-hmm. However, um, I do think, <sighs> I don't know what to call it except racism. I don't know. It's, it, it's, I want to call it racism. I mean, people may find this a bit controversial to accept, yeah. but I, I even came across some posts on social media around like some, uh, students, international students in Ukraine at the time that mm-hmm. were denied buses. Exactly. Like they were trying to transition. They had to walk for hours and some people, like Ukrainians, were able to access buses to transition into a new, a different country, a neighboring country. Mm-hmm. But with some of these international students, some of them were Nigerian, some were uh, Congolese, like basically like in West, Af- West African refu- um, West African refugees um, fleeing from Ukraine. Um, yeah, they were denied yeah. transport transportation. They were denied transportation. You had a lot of reports of them like. Uh, when they were accused to get into a train, they'd mm-hmm. be sent to the back of a line. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't, yeah, it was a lot of uh, students as well, because a lot of students from, like, 
India, India mm-hmm. and um, African and Caribbean countries. Yes, and and I think I, I think that I find it interesting because the reaction that I've seen from people from the global so- south, that is like Africans, like some Asians, some Latin Americans, on social media, I was that some people are like, okay, this is not my problem. Like mm. they, you, the rush, which is a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit of a bold thing to say, right, mm. online. But I've seen people say the Russia and Ukraine war is not an African problem. What are your mm. thoughts on that? Do you think that they should that they wouldn't if something was happening back home, they would not welcome us like mm. that. They wouldn't welcome the people like that. So should other nations be con- equally concerned for these people? Yeah, I mean, I I can completely understand that perspective in terms of, you know, if it was if the roles were reversed, like they, we would not be welcomed, or at least mm-hmm. the journey would be much harder for us. It wouldn't be as easy to be accepted into certain countries. Yeah. But if it's just back to the original question of like, should we care about what's going on in Ukraine? I would say a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about the cost of living crisis, and mm-hmm. we've been talking about how specifically the war. Uh, between Russia and Ukraine is exacerbating that situation because, you know, it's two countries that, you know, are involved in a lot, like, supplies for gas, supplies for food, Mm -hmm. grain. A lot of, you know, countries in Africa right now, they're going through a lot of, like, food food security, Security. a lot of food insecurity problems Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. as a result of uh, this this, this current war. So, should we care? Yes. Yes. I think you should care. I agree. Everyone in the world should care. I agree with you. A war in one between two countries affects everyone. So mm-hmm. if you think that it's not going to affect you because it's not your problem, I mean, mm-hmm. even if there has been some negative history um, around like uh, certain countries accepting other countries as refugees, but as citizens of the globe, as globies, mm-hmm. as um, uh, people of the globe, essentially, we should be concerned about what's happening all over the globe, not just for our people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, I do think like people should take note. I think, mm-hmm. uh, definitely. And I was I was seeing people who were trying their best not to, you know, detract from the conflict in uh between you know Russia and Ukraine right now. Mm-hmm. At the same time, while still highlighting other conflicts happening in the world, because I think you're right. The way people were reporting about Ukraine is mm-hmm. so much more different from the way they report about like. A war happening in a country in the Middle East. Mm. They make, like you were saying, they made it seem as if, like, wow, Ukrainians, our brothers and sisters. Mm. I saw one man who was saying, like, ah, these are people and they're suffering. They have blonde and blue eyes. I'm like, oh, so yeah. suddenly because of blonde and blue eyes, like, you can empathize, you can yeah. see the suffering. But if mm. it was like a brown face, it was someone who is wearing, you know, like a hijab, you wouldn't be able to empathize. Suddenly no. it's not as. Tragic? It's not as tragic. No, that's true. That and that's that's why some people were a bit apathetic towards the the, the refugee current refugee situation in, in Ukraine. Mm. It's because of people saying things like that. So sometimes it deflects from the attention that it's supposed it it, it deserves. Mm-hmm. If you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I think I think it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a, I don't know, it's a bit of a controversial topic. <laughs> it's a controversial topic. Um, but yeah, th- those are our thoughts. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was wondering as well in terms of like the, the different countries and how they react to refugees. Um, I'm always so curious about you know the health perspective and the health of people and how it actually goes down once they arrive in a, in a country. Um, and one thing that I thought was very interesting was uh, if you remember back in 2015, thereabouts, when you, uh, Germany rather was welcoming a lot of refugees from Syria, they were very open. In fact, I remember the chancellor at the time, Angela Merkel, mm-hmm. she changed a law in the EU that typically said that asylum seekers had to stay in the country where they first landed, like they seek asylum where they first landed. But then mm-hmm. she sort of like, you know, went against that law and was like, no, you can come all the way to Germany. Mm-hmm. And what I liked about what they did in Germany is they actually put in a lot of effort to try and like integrate Syrian refugees into mm-hmm. their healthcare system mm-hmm. by actually looking at the fact that hey, we have a lot of people uh, who back home in Syria were like qualified healthcare professionals. Like, yeah. how why don't we just actually try to get them to you know 
uh, helping our own healthcare system. Mm. What do you think about that? Is that is that controversial? Do you think that actually makes sense to, to do to have health? What what do you mean, like to to actually say refugees who are qualified healthcare professionals integrate them into your own health? I mean, why not? Yeah. Why right? not? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it doesn't sound bad, but to some people, I mean. <laughs> yeah. And then that's the other thing that I was that I thought was crazy, because when mm. I was looking into, like, have other countries tried this before? And yes, other countries have. They actually try to retrain, um, you know, refugees and, like, just get them qualified in the country where they are now. Mm-hmm. And the United Kingdom itself, mm-hmm. after the Second World War, Many refugees from that war as well, they were recruited into the National Health Service. This How? NHS that you're trying to prevent refugees from accessing healthcare from NHS, it was also built on the backs of refugees. How ironic. Hmm. How interesting. Hmm. 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 Just some interesting facts there. <laughs> no, it's 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 quite interesting because um now it's now, like, we've seen, like, some refugees have tried to access the NHS, mm. and usually the response is, you know, you, you pay up front. Yes. You pay up front. As much as the NHS is, is free for everyone else, you pay up front. I know, for me, mm-hmm. um, I had to, when I moved to the UK and I had to apply for a visa initially, mm. I had to pay an immigration health surcharge, sure, sure, yeah. um, which was really expensive. Oh, oh, it was really yeah. expensive. And now it's, like, to know that... This was founded mm. based on, you know, the integration of refugees into a new healthcare system. I just, I find it quite fascinating. I find it very interesting. Um, but I was also thinking, do you think countries should have an obligation to just accept refugees? Ah, and I, it was coming at me with heavy questions. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're here for. I think, I don't know, there's not, I don't think there's a yes or no answer mm. to this question. Mm-hmm. I do think that there are some countries that have that have a much higher capacity to welcome refugees than yes. others. There are some countries that are developed that know they can mm-hmm. welcome refugees and there are some countries that cannot. Mm-hmm. But we have to remember that refugees are people of the world. You may think that it's coming from other people. It's like, oh, it's them. It's never going to happen to me until it does. Like, what happened with Ukraine, for example, is like people always assume that war is only happening in somewhere like Syria or like in the Middle East, which is wrong. We, we've already like got into a point where we've normalized, um, we've normalized the Middle East for being a war center, like a, a place, war-torn. a war, to- yeah, exactly, war torn. And now, it's like, okay, we have new countries that are facing difficulties. Now, to answer your question about should all countries welcome refugees, I think all countries should really consider it. But it would be difficult to impose that policy on every single country because every country has a different demographic. Um, for example, someone like China or like Nigeria and that has a very, very highly populated area, a very highly a very high population, it would be very difficult to for them to welcome refugees mm-hmm. because they're really it's a very highly populous country. But in a place where you know they they're not as populated, I think they should consider it and it should be something that is of everybody's concern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I agree with you there. Um but then links back to to the statistic you said before where majority of our refugees at the moment uh, are in low and middle income countries. Mm-hmm. That generally does has me wondering about like how realistic that is in order to try and say high income countries can you do your best to you know welcome more refugees because you have the capacity versus the low and middle income countries where I guess I think because they're just close by yeah. it's just easier for mm-hmm. refugees to make their way there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's 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 somewhere good to start in terms of like actually looking at different countries' capacities. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, my other question. I have so many questions today. Mm, oh, <laughs> ask. Bring yeah, them. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking again, um, because of the the the, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Mm. <laughs> I just had a situation in my mind about what would happen if, for example, there was a doctor 
Ukrainian and they come across a wounded Russian soldier, do they have to treat that soldier? <laughs> and that is trying to dig me into a hole. I know if I start speaking on this, I'll get cancelled. <laughs> I'm just asking a question. <laughs> I'll get cancelled. Yeah. But it's a good question, though. It is a good question. I think that, obviously, on paper, mm-hmm. it would be nice. Mm-hmm. It would it must be nice. It would be nice to think that, okay, um, we... We want to promote peace, right? We want world peace. Mm. And everyone should access healthcare. Mm. And that's what we scream every day. Universal mm. health coverage. Mm. Nobody left behind. Mm. That's our bold statement that we fight for and vouch for. Mm-hmm. However, when it comes to issues concerning conflict, mm-hmm. conflict between two countries mm-hmm. or more, there is a risk that cannot be ignored. Mm-hmm. The risk, what if it's a spy? Oh, the risk of of the a threat to the country. If it, mm. if you have an op- a person or a soldier from an opposing country, and they're coming to claim or uh, trying to access healthcare, you maybe refer them to uh, I don't know uh, the Red Cross or refer them to somewhere that's a bit more neutral mm. because they could come. Imagine a soldier just comes in and you know he says, "Yeah, I have an injury on my leg," but he literally shot himself because he wants to be a spy. Mm. I, I genuinely had not thought of that. I, I just, in my head, I was like, yeah, surely doctors, if they see someone who needs care, they have to treat the person, right? Yeah. No, um, I think there's a point there in terms of, if, if I was trying to imagine myself as the doctor themselves, mm-hmm. um, I feel like such things would go through my head about, ah, if I'm going to bring this person back <laughs> to the hospital, what will they do? Yeah. Once they're feeling better, like, what's going to happen? Yeah. Um, I mean, we have seen a lot of, I remember seeing some videos around where Ukrainians would come uh, through, they'll, like, encounter Russian soldiers mm-hmm. who had, like, abandoned their tanks or something, mm-hmm. um, and they'd be looking for, like, food and whatever, and they'd actually provide food and all these things. Mm-hmm. However, in a healthcare setting, I think it's more complex. Yeah. Because you're also, I'm also thinking about, like, resources. Mm-hmm. A war already means that instead of treating, uh, you know, other conditions that normally we are treating that the population needs and meeting my population's regular health demands, mm-hmm. now I'm treating war injuries and things related to war and, you know, mm-hmm. we're just in crisis. Mm-hmm. So your resources in terms of, like, just doctors themselves are yeah. maybe focusing more on treating injuries mm-hmm. rather than other conditions. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I'm already trying to, like, keep up with, like, this new population health demand. Now am I going to treat someone who is on the opposing side of this war and is contributing to the current problem I am facing. Tricky. Oh, tricky. Tricky. Because think about it this way. When you think of um, treatment, access to medicine, the whole essence of medicine is to put the patients first. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that doctor is going to have that patient's best interest? Or every Mm. doctor... Honestly, maybe one doctor would, right? If they're really kind. But out of fear... Would well, they have that patient's best interest? Because at this point, it's no longer neutral. There's one side, the patient, which is it really a patient? <laughs> There's one side of the patient, supposedly. <laughs> this is allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, allegedly a patient. Uh, let's just say they are really a patient, not a spy. And then there's the other side, was actually a doctor providing care. And now, this doctor needs to have the patient's best interest at heart. Can we trust that this doctor as well will have this patient's best interest at heart? That's a great question. That is a really good question. <laughs> I don't question. think so. <laughs> Me yeah. personally, I may be probably skeptical, but I doubt that if, especially knowing that what's currently happening in their country mm-hmm. and they're seeing their people die, mm-hmm. they're, seeing, they're gonna have some feeling of resentment towards the other side. Yeah. Let's be realistic. Yeah, no, to be real. Yeah. <laughs> But they're also going to be looking at that patient like, oh, that's bad. That's bad. No, sorry maybe, for you. Sorry for, maybe not me. Like, I, me personally, I would be a bit, if I was a doctor in that case, right, yeah. I would be a bit scared. I'm not going to, I would be scared. Yeah. But I would want to help that person just yeah. because I would feel like, okay, you, you look like you're in pain. Yeah. That's just me, like, emotionally thinking I would just want to. But policy-wise and just looking at it with, like, a risk assessment, I think it need, there needs to be, like, some form of referral as well, mm-hmm. somewhere else where, like, okay, you know what, this is a more neutral place where you can access yeah, care. The <laughs> best quality care for you. For you! <laughs> that yeah. leads me on to my point about yeah. um, 
the danger that healthcare workers actually face when trying to act, trying to provide healthcare in conflict zones. Mm. For example, um, in December 2017, the WHO launched the surveillance system for attacks on healthcare, which is called the FSA, which collects detailed primary data. Mm -hmm. And from January to around um, May 2019, there were about 344 attacks on healthcare, which, yeah, which were recorded and leading to 53 deaths and 262 injuries of healthcare workers yeah. and patients. Oh, oh and patients. Okay. Yes. So I'm sorry. I'm guessing this is, you know, 350 healthcare and 350 attacks on healthcare in terms of like healthcare professionals themselves, but also like healthcare facilities. Yes. The 344 attacks on healthcare mm-hmm. and then professionals, 53 deaths actually mm-hmm. due to that. So it could mm-hmm. be linked to uh, bombing, mm-hmm. it could be linked to any form of attack in general okay. was recorded during that short span of time. Mm-hmm. Now, amongst all the seven countries that have reported those attacks, most of them were actually from Ebola affected areas in the Democratic Republic of Congo and had which have recorded the highest number of, of attacks. Now, I remember back in 2019 when I was hearing that um, MSF workers are being attacked. Mm. I think that's very scary, right? Because usually um, to recruit some of these, like ex- the most the most experienced doctors are usually required for these roles, right? So they're mm. having to leave their countries to go abroad to treat patients. And now that poses a risk, imposes a risk on their healthcare yeah. now, which is like, okay, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> we're trying to help you. And now you were trying to hurt us. Yeah. So yeah, it, yeah. it comes to that. And I even came across a story around this like surgeon, a British surgeon mm. from the MSF. Mm. And he said that um, he, well, he worked extensively with the MSF mm. and still finds high security missions challenging. Mm -hmm. And after returning from a mission in Syria where he treated the wounded in an open, an operating theater Mm -hmm. set up in a cave, he said, I've worked in many difficult places with MSF in war zones like Sri Lanka, Ivory Coast, and Somalia. But while in those countries, it was dangerous on the ground. In Syria, the danger always comes from the air. So imagine trying to be a so you might be a surgeon, you literally put just close Steady your eyes, hands. close your eyes, picture yourself being a surgeon, even if you're not, you're in finance, whatever. Yeah. Imagine you are a surgeon and you're trying to treat a patient and you just have boom! <laughs> you just have boom in the air. Are you going to are you going to treat that patient? Yeah, bro. No, guys, it's serious. It's serious. So you were just talking about how traumatizing it is and how usually for you to be able to do that, you need to be, you really need to know your craft. You need to know your expertise really well. And they usually recruit the, literally the most experienced healthcare professionals. Yeah. And he said that it's much more oppressive. It's a much more oppressive type of danger having a helicopter hovering in the sky around you. Yeah. You mean because you're just like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Ha, ah, guys, this is, this is, this is. No, that's horrible. And um, the other thing I always find interesting as well about, like, people who work in such, like, war torn areas mm-hmm. is um, the toll of their mental health. Mm. The toll of their mental health. Yeah. To, th- to be, like, constantly in a state where you think you're in danger. Yeah. But you're also trying to focus on being with, on, like, surgical precision. Surgical that precision. is crazy. I, I can't handle that level of stress. It's not it's, I. It's, it's not stressful. I. It's stressful. It yeah. is. It is really stressful. So, I think that, that, I mean, I respect, I respect the MSF workers. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I honestly, kudos to you. I yeah. rate you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, same. We, we salute you. We salute you. <laughs> Yeah, and what you were saying actually reminded me of the documentary called For Sama. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it to everyone. F O R S A M A. Um, it's essentially about um this woman. She's filming the documentary from the perspective of like 
a letter she is sending or like a video she's sending for her daughter called mm-hmm. Sama, mm-hmm. uh, who was born, I think, you know, around the conflicts when the uprising in Syria happened. Yeah. Um, and she basically that family what they had to do because the husband I think worked in a hospital, mm-hmm. they ended up like camping within like the hospital. Wow. Um, and that's where they would be most of the times. And mm-hmm. she was pregnant, gave birth to the kid during the, the, the conflicts, during the peak of the conflicts, trying to raise this kid. At the same time, they're wow. in this hospital. Wow. Every day they're seeing people who need treatment, people yeah. who, from like injuries, people mm-hmm. who are pregnant and still need regular care. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it goes through like, you know, people they lost along the way, like sometimes mm-hmm. doctors, like they go out and then they just, mm-hmm. they, yeah. It's, it's, I think, a great one to just, see the realities of what it is like yeah. um, in a healthcare setting, setting. during war, especially mm. that idea of like when there's air raids and there's bombings oh, all yeah. over. Mm. Um, it's it's it really is a good one. Um, mm. because we can say a lot of statistics and we know a hundred million is a big number, but sometimes when you see it happening to one person and then you try to think like ah, how many people how are happening? many people yeah. yeah yeah highly recommend. Yes, no that's that's really let me tell you guys really sad. It is that leads me on to my point. I want to stay positive here. Okay. What can we do better? What can be done better? What can be done? How can we end war, Edna? First of all, how do we... Because to me, when you ask me, what can we do better? I'm like, can we just stop fighting? <laughs> can we stop? Let's stop the war. Can we stop the war? Can I, we? I think... I personally don't think it's possible to stop wars. Mm. Um, me... Personally, maybe a cynical view, but I think history repeats itself. Mm-hmm. Um, war has been a huge part of human history. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think war is used as a means to an end. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of strategy that the politicians mm-hmm. use these days, but sometimes when that strategy is not working, the diplomacy is not working. We, I don't want to sign a treaty. I don't want to do negotiation. I want to just go to war. Yeah. I'm just going to invade and do it by force. I mm-hmm. think we see that happening a lot in history, and it's you know, it's just. It's part of our nature almost, I'm sorry yeah. to say. Like, just conflict, just conflict, fighting. And, fighting. Yeah. Do you think that people actually want to end war? Do I think people... I think us as, like, regular citizens, yes, we want to see an end to war. Mm-hmm. Our politicians... I don't know. Mm, <laughs> I don't mm. know. I think some of them will say, some yes, of, them, yeah. of course, we want peace, we want prosperity, mm. blah, blah, but... I do think there's some that think it will always be necessary. And so I don't think they generally want to end it, but mm-hmm. there's definitely a sense of like, we must always be prepared. We must always be prepared. Yeah. No, that's what do you think? What, what do I think? Yeah, do you think we can end war and do people want to end it? Do people want to end it? That's a, that's a great question. See, I may sound mushy. <laughs> I actually sound mushy. I think it's it's possible to end war and put an end to a war if everyone really decides let's all come together and do this. Um, whilst there has been um it's, there have been efforts that have been made, like we've seen it with, you know, the UN and you know, all these different places. <clears throat> um, but I, I do think that the the issue, me personally, that's my personal opinion, that there are parties that do not want to end it and I think when greed comes into play and um yeah when greed comes into play and power uh, Mm -hmm. power politics comes into play it's very difficult to convince people to end a war especially with politicians and but then that goes back to the foundation of like who is the war who elects these politicians right who is always the people so it's like if we get people that are elected that are actually fighting for a collective effort Mm -hmm then yes it's possible to do it but the question is are people willing to are people willing to i I think it's a big question that people try to think about yeah do how do we end war the un that's its one of its big missions Mm -hmm. you know it's a it was set up right after a war because people just did not want war and they understand that it's terrible but yeah we still have it and and at Um, least um no, go ahead. On a on a positive, on a more positive note, we've seen that the well, at least we're not going through a World War Three. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, we had World War One, which was crazy. We had World War Two, but imagine now the whole. I'm trying to be positive here in the sense that 
things have improved in a way like we're no longer facing um uh like we had the Rwandan genocide, we had um, the Holocaust, we've had like so many very tragic experiences mm-hmm. and we've said, okay, this is not this is not going to happen again. And I think there are measures that have been put in place to ensure that these things don't happen again. Mm-hmm. However, there are civil wars still going on. There are still countries that are still fighting. So it's, like, it's difficult to control. It's very difficult. I think it's just really difficult to prevent conflict amongst human beings. Mm. It's like inevitable yeah. on us on the, for an, at a personal level, and definitely when you think about peop, uh, countries, um, yeah, it's conflict will occur. Yeah. Um. So I think maybe for 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 us the globies, <laughs> for us because we we can't control them. <laughs> we can't control them. But um, in general, I think it's much more useful for us to think about what we can do at least to minimize the impacts of war on mm-hmm. the people that are mostly affected, mm-hmm. um, rather than how do we solve war. It's, <laughs> it's, that's a whole other thing. That's a whole topic. We'll spend all day talking about it. Yeah, no, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, for me, it could be as simple as, you know, there are obviously a lot of funds out there, and a lot of relief aids. Mm-hmm. Looking into those, donating to the ones, I... I think sometimes it can be controversial because you can look at how much money is donated and given to some of these organizations and how much actually ends up helping people who are affected. Yeah. But honestly, I feel like you can make that judgment for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you can donate clothes. You mm-hmm. can help out at refugee centers. You can volunteer. Volunteering. You can run an art course for mm-hmm. children or mm-hmm. asylum seekers, mm-hmm. um, unaccompanied migrants. There's so many people I think that I need of just general human empathy and you know some of these just regular activities so that's one way we can each at least help out yeah no i i i break that (laughs) (laughs) i think that sometimes yes i can be quite skeptical with um who i'm donating to Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you are someone that that you may find yourself being skeptical about donating or what if you want to do something physically i prefer to do something physically so you can i don't know but you have clothes clothes in your in your closet that you don't use anymore that you maybe that that you wear you haven't worn for at least six months mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, maybe <laughs> that she in hole that you do that she in what? Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> think about putting them in the bag and going and give them to save save the children give it to uh this caritas mm-hmm. give it to people salvation army salvation there we go salvation army there are these organizations where you can actually donate or you could decide to maybe go more up front even like within the country that you're in, just mm-hmm. try to find people that you can go ahead and speak to, maybe spread awareness, mm-hmm. or even your expertise. Like, if you are if you speak English, you could, I don't know, um, help, if you know a refugee, especially because now we're having this whole Ukraine um, and Russia war, and you have, we're having refugees coming into into um, the UK. So if you're someone that's living in the UK and you know you want to help out the refugee, there, there are courses, I think that there are local authorities that offer um schemes yes. for you know, British people to help out uh Ukrainians in terms of like English and just like housing in general. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And the other thing I think that um I thought was great when I was reading about the um what is it called? <laughs> well I was just talking about the <laughs> the 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 measures. Oh my days, why am I blanking? The measures. The measures. Mm-hmm. You remember the measures? Yes. Uh, sorry. The hostile environment measures. Mm-hmm. I got it. There you go. <laughs> the hostile environment measures. Um, is I saw there was a response, a huge response from doctors and healthcare workers from the NHS. You know, there was a whole docs not cops movement, mm-hmm. patients not passports. So I think it is also very important for people who are also healthcare workers, people who provide healthcare, mm-hmm. to advocate for you know, the maximum number of people to get access and not Mm -hmm. to have to be charged thousands and thousands of pounds Mm -hmm. um, when they are just in no position to pay that amount of money. It just just does, I'm sorry, it does not make sense to ask refugees, Mm -hmm. someone seeking asylum to pay that amount of money. It's like, I've come here with very Mm -hmm. little. How am I going to make that work? Mm -hmm. Um, So definitely, if you can, uh, patients not passports, they have a whole website. If you want to get in and, you know, uh, advocate through them, that's another avenue. Yes, and another thing I can think of is 
spreading awareness. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned earlier, that there has been a higher acceptance of refugees in the recent years Mm -hmm. in comparison to 2015. And it's simply because there are places where currently where there is war and people fail to acknowledge it or either they fail to acknowledge it internationally or it's a matter of, okay, we're used to hearing about uh, war in this particular country. For example, I know with Cameroon, for example, there's the Anglophone crisis that has been going on Mm -hmm. since 2016. But because it's quite a small country, um, it it hasn't gotten as much international attention. It hasn't gotten as much. But there there has been like a civil war between like the Francophones and the Anglophone. And people have died. People have lost their lives. I have friends that have like lost their lives due to that. People, I've heard Mm -hmm. of people that have lost their lives due to that. And simply because there's, there's, I've seen people spreading awareness, but literally at the moment, it's only Cameroonians doing it. I've seen only, Mm -hmm. mostly it's literally Cameroonians doing it. So I think maybe like looking out for each other, like just because, you know, you may not be from that country, it's, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be concerned. Like we should all look out for each other and be concerned for each other. Yeah. 100%. Mm-hmm. Agree, agree, agree. And on that note, we'll wrap things up. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, heavy topic, mm-hmm. but you know, we try to touch on a lot of different things, uh, different perspectives. Yes. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that discussion. If you did, you know, please leave a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe on Spotify. I am Edna. And I'm Jocelyn. We are Young Global Health Professionals and your host for the World Health Investigation Podcast. And please, 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 if you are in London, we are having a debate on the 9th of November 2022. It's in a few weeks' time. Please register if you haven't. If you get your free tickets, it's going to be a heated room. We're tackling the most heavy healthcare topic. Mm -hmm. We're giving you a flavor of what this is about. We're going to touch on different things. If there's anything you want, if you want to have a say, please feel free to DM us in our socials, Mm -hmm. but get your tickets ASAP because we're inviting guests from very, very different backgrounds in different multi, in a multidisciplinary setting. So please, please, please get your tickets ASAP. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Thank you. And if you want to follow us, if you want to see all of what we're doing, stay up to date with what we're doing. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, at underscore, no, at WHI underscore podcast. And you can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Just look up World Health Investigation Podcast. You can follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe. 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 Just press the button. Right now. You're already here. You're already here. You're to the end. You're already here. Just, you might as well press subscribe. Well. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much and have a lovely rest of the week. <laughs>